So don't worry, you guys are going to get all the videos okay, uh, this week. So we won't be missing anything. Now, chapter 22 went over obstructive pulmonary diseases, so anything that's obstructing the airway. Keep in mind that when we talk about with this chapter of restrictive pulmonary diseases, this particular chapter actually involves any type of alteration that happens to, let's just say, the outside or the respiratory area or the pleural cavity. Pleural cavity, chest wall, um, also anything that's sort of extra pulmonary as well. So let's just say also most of these diseases do involve the um, parenchyma of the lung or let's just say the area of the alveoli. Okay. So they will be damaged to the alveoli with this, uh, these types of diseases. Now, they are characterized by having, and let's just say this, all pulmonary functional testing will be abnormal, okay, or decrease, okay, just to make that simple. And when we talk about arterial blood gases, decrease in oxygen supply, okay, and on the flip side, we would either have normal, <coughs> depending on the, the disease process and how explain, or a decrease in um, carbon dioxide. Okay, depending on if the person's hyperventilating and so forth. Now, the first one I just want to make sure I get the right picture right. Thank you so much. Yes, honey comb. Okay, sorry about that. Now, the first one we're going to go over is something called diffuse interstitial lung disease. Okay, diffuse interstitial lung disease. Um, please keep in mind that this is a type of fibrosis that occurs in the pulmonary area. So this is a fibrosis. This is thickening of the alveolar, okay? Now, if we have a thickening or a fibrosis of the alveolar, what will be a main issue here that you would imagine? Diffusion. Uh, diffusion, okay? So diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So obviously there will be an issue with that crossing, okay, of carbon and carbon, oxygen and carbon dioxide. Alveoli, keep in mind that is where gas exchange takes place, but keep in mind what allows that gas exchange to take place is the capillaries that sit over it, okay? So I don't want you to think and just go back to anatomy that the alveoli alone is doing it, but it's actually the capillaries that are there, okay? But in essence, if the alveoli itself is thickening or if it's not functioning, it's definitely going to cause an issue with the fusion. Okay, so what causes this thickening? Please keep in mind with most respiratory diseases, there's usually some sort of inflammatory response where these cells come to the area and it does this whole rebuilding thing that actually causes, it's, the body's doing what it's supposed to do, but in essence it actually causes now a congestion, okay, to make it simple, and the alveolar level. Okay, so they're saying here it begins with some sort of injury to the alveolar epithelium. If it gets injured, if the body detects injury, what's the first thing that's going to happen? White blood cells. White blood cells are going to come to the area, so the immune process is kicked in. All those cells are going to rush to that site. It will go through the immune process, and then in turn with that, as the body starts to heal, if we are trying to heal a cut epithelium, it's actually going to start to rebuild, okay, and build up. And so what will happen here is that you'll get a thickening at the alveolar wall, okay? which we don't want the alveoli to be thick. As you remember from anatomy, alveoli is actually simple squamous epithelium. We need it to be simple squamous epithelium to have proper diffusion, okay? So if it becomes thick, that's an issue. Okay, so the other thing here is that lung tissue can become infiltrated from all the white blood cells that come into place. Um, person, uh, people can have, excuse me, persistent alveolitis, okay? So what does that mean? This whole alveolar level will just get inflamed. It will fill up with cells and cause a lot of issues there along with fibrosis and uh, diffusion, as you can imagine. And then what will happen here is because of the fact that um, diffusion is not taking place, sometimes these alveolar sacs will start to enlarge because they're filled with air. 
air is not distributing or being diffused as it should, so then it'll just fill up and cause these very large sacs. <clears throat> you don't have to worry about this slide because we're going to go through each and every topic. So don't worry about that right now. Okay. <coughs> Pathogenesis inflammation occurs early. It is reversible. But once we get to the fibrosis level, please understand that that's irreversible. You cannot reverse fibrosis. Okay, once it's there, it's there. Fibrosis, I already went over what happens with that. So as the body starts to heal, the alveolar walls become very thick because it's trying to heal that epithelial tissue. And the last stage here is because what happens if that fibrosis is very thick and now we have these alveoli that are just very large and filled with air, this can cause the destruction of the wall. Okay, so it will start to break. Now, clinical manifestations here, these patients will have difficulty breathing, so dyspnea. Um, associated with this chapter is this picture here. This is called honeycomb lung. Okay, honeycomb lung and this is in interstitial, excuse me, diffuse interstitial lung disease. What is honeycomb lung? If we were to look at a, a regular normal lung, okay, uh, you would see that this would be nice and smooth. Okay, you would not see this porous situation. It looks like a sponge. Okay, and then the other thing too is um, I don't know if she showed you the picture of emphysema, but with emphysema, emphysema actually looks like this, but the difference between this and emphysema, the lung is actually black because of all the smoke, okay, that people have emphysema. So with this situation, it's, um, they're showing you it's not as black as we were looking at a lung that is damaged with emphysema. But in any event, as you can see, the alveoli is destroyed. When you have alveolar destruction, you have these little grape-like structures that now sort of get blown out and if you want to say turn into little cannibals or something, okay? So they get very large and destroyed. And so when they get large and blown out, it will give this sort of appearance in the lung, okay? And as you can see, <coughs> those big craters there, okay? Now, this is a CT scan of it. And as you can see, it's very porous, okay? Even on a CT scan, okay? So you can definitely see that. The other thing that's associated with this uh, which we're going to go over in a second. And I know that looks like, what is it, Frodo? E.T. E.T., yeah, E.T. Yeah, e <laughs> <laughs> I like Lord of the Rings, I think. Holy, what's that? Okay, so in any event, um, this is clubbing of the nail beds, okay? Now, clubbing of the nail beds is something that's also in patients that have emphysema, okay? And I do want you to jot that down because it's one of those clinical signs and symptoms that, um, clinical findings that you will see. Now, this clubbing of the nail beds can be seen uh, with pretty much, I shouldn't say all respiratory disorders, but it can be seen commonly in most respiratory disorders. And the reason why, they do have two kind of philosophies behind it. One philosophy is that because of the decreased oxygen, it will now cause this sort of buildup in the nail beds. But then there was one book that I was reading that said that because of the inflammatory process that occurs with these individuals, because it's usually like a hypersensitivity type situation, that it can now cause an inflammation of the fingers, okay, or the nail beds there. So it's two things. It's either lack of oxygen and inflammation, okay, that can cause this. Now, usually when patients have this, please understand that not everyone is going to have clubbing of the nail beds right away, but this is more of a late stage or late finding. <clears throat> okay, so here we go. Clubbing of the nail beds. Okay, so the other thing they talked about here was um, okay. So clubbing of the nail beds, shallow breathing, non-productive call. Um, Non-productive cough, I want you to highlight that because what happens is there are some respiratory diseases that have a productive cough and some that do not. 
And I do need you to know which ones have a productive fault and which ones don't. Please keep in mind that just to help you out, those reproductive disorders that have a pathophysiology of producing mucus or having goblet cell production are the ones that have a productive cough, okay, because they're producing mucus. Those that don't have that type of situation will not have a productive cough, okay. So non-mucus producing, so this is non-mucus producing, okay. They will have uh, crackles, okay. Now crackles in the lung could be fluid, and keep in mind not mucus, but fluid. But this fluid is, just keep in mind, escudated fluid. So when the body goes through the inflammatory process, it does release a certain amount of fluid that can be heard in the lungs. So when you guys listen to these patients, you'll hear that sort of crackling uh, rails type of situation. Cyanosis is late finding, and when we talk about cyanosis, this is going to be the blue lips, blue fingertips, blue bluish appearance that can happen to the tissues um, because of the lack of oxygen. So keep in mind that this does not happen right away, but over time as the body continues to deplete of oxygen. Anorexia, weight loss, and inability to increase cardiac output. Um, I'm not going to hold you responsible for that, so you don't have to worry about that slide. And I'm sorry I'm breezing through this for the sake of time. Diagnosis here, chest x-ray. Um, Chest x-ray will show the honeycomb appearance on the lung, just to let you know. Pulmonary functional test will be decreased. Open lung biopsy will also show the, the honeycomb appearance of the lung as well. Transbronchial biopsy will actually be able to detect the inflammation <coughs> that's going on. And gallium 67 this is a type of nuclear scan that can detect diseased tissues. Okay. And the bronchiolophage, this is inserted into the windpipe for them to take a sample of fluid to see the type of inflammation that's going on as well. Bronchioavialophage is a sample of fluid that's taken. She should have went over my notes. Did she go over this stuff? No. I'm so sorry. And I think she wrote, skip to slide 36. <laughs> skip to slide 36. She said she was following your quiz. No, I gave her my notes. To, you see this? I prepped just like you guys. So I gave her my notes to follow, but she didn't. Okay. It's going to be a fun test. It's okay. No, it's a take home, so don't worry. Okay. That's why I'm doing a take home, so just to make it fair. Okay. Now, treatment. Stop smoking. <laughs> okay, so they do believe, even though it's not a no known, known cause, okay, they always say smoking is one of those things, okay. So avoid environmental exposure. Now let me just say this, even though we can't say, okay, well this is definitely this, what happens, you want to stop whatever activity that can cause a possible inflammation in the respiratory tract, okay. So whether that is working in an environment with a bunch of dust, okay, or working somewhere, um, that's causing a persistent allergy or whatever it is, okay, that can cause this type of situation. And if it gets bad, the patients do need a lung transplant. <clears throat> Isn't that a certain category for like occupational? Yes, and so we do have a certain category for occupational, sir, uh, excuse me, occupational lung diseases, which I'm going to go over. But with diffuse interstitial lung disease, the, the way to pinpoint, they say it could be smoking, but then it's also some environmental exposure too. So we don't want to put it under that category, but it can be one of two things. Okay, something that's causing that irritation. Now, sarcoidosis. Um, some of you guys may have heard of this already. Okay. Now, with sarcoidosis, um, they give you all the incidents here, so you can take a look at that. Now, the main pathophysiological situation here, they say that the activation of aviolar macrophage to unknown trigger. Sarcoidosis is, um, can fall under the category as what we call sort of like an autoimmune type of disease, okay, because these patients don't know what triggers it. The problem here is that these patients have an activation of alveolar macrophages. If you have an alveolar macrophage, what do you think it's doing? It's engulfing. It's getting bigger, but it's engulfing and trying to engulf whatever type of agent that's there in the alveoli, which means if we have an increase of macrophages doing this type of activity, what is that going to do to the alveoli? 
it's going to eat it up or start to destroy the alveoli. Okay, so please understand that we want macrophages, but in small amounts and not destroying the tissue area. So the issue here is that these macrophages will destroy the tissue. So the pathogenesis here is that the other thing here with this inflammatory issue that goes on, or immune response, is that these patients do develop non-caseating epithelioid granulomas. Okay, so you probably wonder what is that? Okay. Did I skip something? I'm on slide um, 17. Okay. Non-caseating epithelioid granulomas. Okay, now, what is a granuloma? Okay, what a granuloma is, just to let you know, this is a ball of immune cells. So say, for example, we have all our white blood cells and everything that's there. It's just a ball of immune cells that actually sort of form like a cyst formation. Okay. When we talk about non-caseating, remember that we, I think we talked about caseating when we went over wet gangrene. Okay. So when we're talking about that, that's actually something that's wet or oozing or something that's fluid-like. When we talk about non-caseating, that means that it's more of a solid. So this is a solid ball of immune cells. That's the best way to explain it. Okay. Now, these solid ball of immune cells can obviously cause a lot of havoc, okay, and especially if they start to deposit in different areas of the body. So these are the organs that they normally affect. Please make sure that you know all of the organs, not just the lung tissue. Okay, so obviously we know the lung tissue. Uh, but also the lymph nodes, spleen, liver, and so forth. So they also contribute as two to having an abnormal T cell function. So that is a nice little diagram there showing you what those macrophages do. So I would say please make sure that you just kind of go through this diagram at home. It's very simple. Now, clinical manifestations. Let's go over some of the clinical findings that these patients will have. <coughs> Malaise, fatigue, weight loss, we all know that this is a dry, non-productive cough, hint, hint, there is no mucus that's being produced here. Um, erythema nauseum, I want you to know that that is actually what we call um, inflammatory red yeah, tenders, I don't know how to explain this, but it's sort of like inflammatory spots on the skin. So it's inflammatory lesions on the skin. Let's just say that, lesions on the skin. I'm sorry, inflammatory lesions on the skin. Oh, I was going to say, you have a picture of it. Oh, yes, I do have a picture of it. I'm going to show you in one second. I have, I have a picture of macules and papules, I think. Or do I have a picture of that? I'll show you. So macules and papules. Macules is what we call a flat lesion, <clears throat> which as papules is an elevated lesion or a raised lesion. These patients can also have hyperpigmentation and sometimes subcutaneous nodules. So let me show you the pictures that I do have. Yeah. So let me just show this picture first, okay? This is a chest x-ray of a person that has sarcoidosis, okay? What I want you to notice is here. that this is the lung okay the lung field is looking the way it's supposed to <coughs> now because the lung field has sort of this white appearance in the lung field that's sticking out and this is really coming from the hilum of the lung this is going to be the area of what we call those non-caseating granulomas okay so understand that when we look at a lung field on x-ray this should all be black Anytime you see white, that's telling us that it's some sort of infiltrate, whether that's immune cells or whatever's going on. Um, usually, if a person has like a pneumonia or something, some, you won't see it so close to the hilum. It may be out more in, in the lung field. Okay. Now, <clears throat> okay, this is a macule. So... This is a flat lesion here, okay, and that looks very horrible, okay, on the skin, okay, and then 
What they're showing you here, down here in this picture, I don't know if you can see this clearly, but you see this black area, and again, it's near the hilum. These are the non-caseating granulomas. And as you can see, they're pretty well defined. It almost looks like you can go in and scoop it out, okay? So which tells you that it's a solid form. It's a solid form of immune cells. <clears throat> so those are the three pictures you're responsible for. Well, all of these, really, but for sarcoidosis, let me make sure. So, diagnosis here, leukopenia, anemia, um, you can read through all of these, but let me just point out a few things here with the diagnosis and why some of these levels are increased and elevated. Elevated liver enzymes because keep in mind that this will attack the liver. Liver is one of the spots or one of the locations where the, they will have these granulomas. Um, increase in calcium levels. Increase in calcium levels because it can start to affect the bone and these patients can have a breakdown of bone, therefore releasing blood calcium or increasing the blood calcium level. So please understand that these Laboratory findings that are here is because of the destruction that's happening to the actual organs that's associated with it. Okay, now, Galadium 67, okay, again, this, we talked about this scan before. This is a scan that actually will detect disease tissues, and it will show the areas of those granulomas. Okay, so make sure you know that. Pulmonary functional testing can be normal, maybe in the early disease process, and then it can get to more of a restrictive where those patients will start to have a decrease in oxygen and increase in carbon dioxide, okay? Or excuse me, functional testing in the ABGs. Functional testing where the pulmonary volumes will be going. Bronchial alveolar lafage, when they do this sort of um, sample, okay, out of the <coughs> bronchial area, they can actually see where those immune cells will see a high increase of lymphocytes, okay, and see what's going on there. The biopsy will also show the non-caseating granulomas, and they do say this is a definitive diagnosis. I would highlight that, hint, hint, just in case if you see that on the test or something. <laughs> and chest x-ray, uh, definitive stages. So what happens here is that when you see that chest x-ray that I showed you, at that point, this is now where they start to stage these individuals. Okay, so. Zero is normal, I don't even know why had that. <laughs> stage is normal. Okay. So stage one is a good prognosis, meaning that they just have hyalur adenopathy only, meaning that if we were to look at just the hilum of the lung, they may have a little bit of infiltrates and that's it. Stage two is when they have now hyalur infiltrates and now going into the pulmonary, bronchopulmonary area. Stage three is when they have pulmonary infiltrates without the adenopathy, so now it has spread through the pulmonary or, or the bronchial tree. And stage four is with advanced fibrosis where you see honeycomb appearance and just a lot of destruction to the alveoli. Treatment they have here is corticosteroids, okay, and immunosuppressants. Run out of time. This is crazy. Okay. It is a lot. This chapter is a lot. That's um, yeah. okay. So hypersensitivity pneumonitis. This one is quite interesting because for the first time we are seeing a disease that is predominant in non-smokers. <laughs> okay. So a disease that's prominent in non-smokers. Um, they do consider this uh, a known extrinsic allergic alveolitis. What does that mean? That means that these individuals do have a known allergy to whatever that agent is, which I'm going to go over the different um, allergens. And this known allergy will give them the inflammation of <coughs> the alveoli. Now, again, this can be confusing, and you make this comment, uh, Susie, that the, this can be restrictive of occupational diseases. So even though it doesn't fall under the category of occupational lung disease, but most of the times this is an occupational lung disease. Okay, so not to confuse you, but so it sounds like when they when when it's a possibility, they don't categorize it as that. But when 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 there's an absolute link, linkage, yes, then they yes. But and I'll show you why they call this because all of these um, causes here are usually from occupations that I'm just gonna I'm gonna go over here in the chart. 
Now, most of this stuff looks a little strange, and, and people that, and I don't know about farm life, but those people that grew up on a farm and know about farm uh, may know some of this stuff. So this is when individuals are kind of allergic to, say, molded hay. Um, they have molded sugar cane pulp, um, in, insect infested grains. So these are a lot of things I want to kind of say, like maybe farm type allergies. Yeah. Um, and this falls under this category, which again, um, not to say that it's occupational, but this is quite occupational. Okay, most of the time it's <coughs> occupational. Um, fish meat workers lung okay um, even say in this I don't think it's here but even rodents okay sometimes rodents do carry people are allergic to whatever it is that rodents carry and sometimes they can um, have this situation too um, and have anyone in here ever been to a fish house if you ever been to a fish house you never want to go back <laughs> fish house like a factory not a yeah. restaurant no not a restaurant <laughs> where they bring in the fish off the of this so um, unfortunately uh, I went to one and there's a lot of mice that run around mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and so they do attract yes and this is in New York actually so you know New York has more rats than people so, <laughs> as they say they got big rats too. yes they do <laughs> so um, um, yeah a lot of people oh they want to go out to eat in New York and eat at your own risk you know, you never know. Um, but yeah anyway working in conditions like that where people are around certain rodents and animals and things that can produce a, a kind of give off a type of allergen so the pathogenesis here is whatever allergen that they are allergic to and so what happens here is that when the body goes through the whole process of this particular allergen and goes through the antibody um, antigen reaction, it will actually cause this type of destruction to the alveolar walls. Okay, so now it will cause this sort of alveolitis. Now, <clears throat> this type of antigen antibody complex can elicit a granuloma. Okay, so not like a full big granuloma like sarcoidosis, but it can elicit these immune cells or wall of immune cells to just kind of sit in that area of the lung and obviously can lead to injury. And uh, they say here that they must have a delayed hypersensitivity type 4 reaction to antigen to develop pneumonitis. So what does that mean? Say, for example, if this patient is around molded hay or whatever, and they're around that molded hay, but they don't start to have a reaction to it until maybe three days or four days later. So they will have a delayed hypersensitivity. When they have a delayed hypersensitivity, that's when they consider this a pneumonitis, okay, because the pneumonitis is associated with that type of hypersensitivity. So, when it's acute, okay, acute is short-lived, okay, and it will resolve in 18 to 24 hours, okay, so that's a good situation. There are all the signs and symptoms there, okay. When it's acute, they will have a dry cough, hint, hint, no mucus production, um, dyspnea, tachypnea, and chest discomfort. Okay. Um, they could have crackles in the lung. Don't forget why they have crackles in the lung. Because of the es excudate, excuse me, fluid that comes from the immune process. So they will have the crackles in the lung okay, because of that. Okay. Now, intermediate means that it's now more of an itis. So they will have fever associated with this. And they can have pulmonary fibrosis, okay, if it gets that bad with the cough. Now, does she go over call pulmonary and what that means? She started, I think she started with the occupational. I'm kind of nervous about This is the reason why I'm giving you a take home. Yeah. 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 Anytime a patient has a lung disorder, okay, and that lung disorder for some reason causes pulmonary hypertension, okay, and I'm explaining this if you want to jot it down, you can. So anytime a person has a respiratory disorder that causes them to have pulmonary hypertension, that pulmonary hypertension could cause a backup of blood into the right side of the heart. Does everybody understand that? Okay, if you know circulation. When it causes a backup of blood into the right side of the heart, 
this can lead to right-sided heart failure. And they term that car pulmonality. Car pulmonality is a term that's only used for right-sided heart failure only in lung diseases. So they, if somebody has a primary from a cardiovascular issue, you don't use that term car pulmonality. And from my understanding, I believe you guys were charted that way, car pulmonality, when it's associated with a respiratory disease. Okay, so if it's just a cardiovascular issue, you don't say call from an alley. That's the right side, you said? Right side. Right side of heart failure. But please understand that this situation only happens if it's a pulmonary hypertension situation that's associated with this. Okay. Because of the narrowing of the pulmonary artery. Right, because the pulmonary artery gets narrow, <laughs> there's um, <coughs> constriction, okay, blood starts to back up, gets stuck, and starts to back up into the right side of circulation. Okay, and then therefore the right side of the heart suffered. Okay, so chronic more fibrosis in the upper lobes. Okay. You can see this on chest x-ray and I'm going to show you a picture in a second. Um, now, skin testing. Please highlight this. These patients are allergic to molded sugar cane and molded hay and, and animals and things. Okay, so they have a known allergy. So yes, huh? skin testing. Slide 34. Okay, so yes, they have to go to the allergist and have the allergist draw all over their bodies. Okay, to uh, get to see exactly what is going on with them. Now, laboratory testing. Yes, they will have an increase of white blood cells. We know this because it's an inflammatory situation. And it will have a decrease in oxygen because of that alveolar fibrosis. Okay. And pulmonary functional testing will be decreased. And the way to treat this is to stop, <laughs> leave the farm. Okay, you know what? Um, I'm not going to use this picture. I apologize. This picture is not that great because it can be confused with sarcoidosis. Okay. Um, I just realized that. So you'll see infiltrates, but they say with um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis that it's not so close to the hilum. It's actually out or more to the upper lobes a little bit. But you can't really tell that from that x-ray, so I'm sorry about that. It's going now, here we go with occupational lung disease. Do you guys need a break or you okay? <laughs> it's okay, you can tell me. It's hard to say we need a break. I know, it's, it's, it's a very here, difficult so. day, I know. Um, she went kind of in depth on that. She went in depth on that. Okay, so I can read. Okay, so she went into all of this carbon monoxide and the ozone layer. Okay, all right. So you went into that pneumoconiosis. This is where we started. Black lung, asbestosis, which is quite common. Okay, you went into all that. Okay, predisposing factors. Now, one thing I just want to highlight with these occupational lung diseases, and you guys.